I'm Angela Kelly Robeck, host of the Empowered Principal Podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Teaching While Queer is a podcast for 2S LGBTQ plus educational professionals to share their experiences in academia. Hi, I'm your host, Brian Stanton, a theater pedagogue and educator in New York City. And my goal is to share stories from around the world from 2S LGBTQ plus educators. I hope you enjoy Teaching While Queer. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Teaching While Queer. Today, I have the wonderful Lens Aimer with me. Hi, Lens. How are you doing? Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm I'm doing well. How are you? I'm uh, I'm doing great. I am so excited that you're here, honestly, because uh, well, one, I read your book. I I follow queer kids stuff on Instagram, so I'm a huge uh, proponent of the educational work that you're doing, like both in the classroom and out of the classroom so thanks for being here i appreciate it of course happy to be here so i know about all the things that you do why don't you share a little bit about yourself with my audience yeah for sure so uh my name is lynn's uh yeah hi (laughs) (laughs) i use they them pronouns i uh am you know multi-hyphenate creator i am an author i write for preschool television animation. I am an educator and an activist and a performer. I wear lots and lots of hats. I got a whole hat rack of my own. (laughs) And uh, I'm probably most well known for making queer stuff for kids. That's kind of my jam. That's kind of what I do. And I started doing that uh, in about 2016 when I started my web series, Queer Kid Stuff. Um, that a lot of people probably know about who are listening to this podcast, but is essentially uh, Mr. Rogers Sesame Street meets Queer Theory 101 um, for preschoolers. Lots of singing, lots of books and stories, lots of just like educational and entertaining, hopefully, um, videos and resources. Um, we do a lot. And uh, yeah, I think that's kind of the basic rundown of me and what I do. I'm sure we'll get into a lot more of it. For sure. So um, let's take a journey back in time. And I would like to learn about what it was like for you as a queer youth uh, growing up in the society that we have. Yeah, this, um, this year society, for sure. (laughs) Um, I was a pretty happy kid. Um, Very very much a why kid, lots of questions, always wanting to know stuff. Why is the sky blue? All of that had a very, very long phase of that. Um, Grew up in New York City uh, and had just like generally a really good childhood. And then um, kind of like, you know, expectations of gender and sexuality and all these things kind of hit. And I started to really kind of struggle in my like tween and especially into my teen years um, really not having kind of an understanding of my queerness, not even touching gender at the time. And it caused a lot of mental health problems for me in especially my teen years. Um, and I think the way that I kind of coped with that was through writing, through theater, especially. Um, those were kind of like my main outlet and singing and performance. Those were kind of my outlets. Um, and I kind of took that and wanted to have a creative career and did a theater undergrad degree and took uh, gender studies classes at the same time and was kind of like, why can't I do these two things at the same time? And uh, that's kind of what led me to my career. But um, yeah, I would say my queerness and my identity is just, I mean, incredibly informative to what I do today. Um, I also work mostly in early childhood um and my mom has been an early childhood music educator my entire life um she kind of came up through theater and uh, we've had similar interests (laughs) through our lives um runs in the family i guess 
And so I kind of grew up with her teaching music classes and, you know, being the kid who, you know, hid under the table. And then, you know, lo and behold, I'm a professor, professional performer and musician now. So <laughs> you never know if uh, even if your kid is, you know, hiding under the table or not paying attention, they might actually be absorbing things um, in a more profound way than you might know. And uh, yeah, my mom has continued to do that. And I think that, that certainly influenced um, uh, how and the path that I've taken with my art and my educational practice. Um, yeah, and I think uh, something that I always say about queer kids stuff is that it's I, I, I made it because it's what I wish I had when I was that age, right? I hope that kind of like thinking about education as an a uh, preventative measure and um, uh, early intervention, essentially. Because um, I feel like, I don't know, this is all projection and like I can't gift my younger self queer kid stuff, right? So what I try to do is give that to today's young people and hope that the intervention that like I wished I had, just by like, you know, having the language to describe how I felt about how I wanted to present myself to the world and being able to have tools to combat, you know, you have to wear a dress every Friday to school because you're supposed to. And me being able to say like, hey, like actually I don't want to do that because it doesn't make me feel good. Like I didn't really have the language to say that. And even through my teen years, right? Like, you know, when I my parents wanted me to dress up for a nice dinner. It was always, you know, go downstairs and take the jeans off. And even if they were nice jeans, right. And put on a skirt or a dress. And that, um, I think it took me a really long time to understand how profoundly that hurt me. And I think, um, yeah, I wish I'd had those or learned those tools earlier so that I could not necessarily like defend myself, but like have confidence and stand up for myself, right? And like have that sense of independence because I've always been like a very independent and uh, <laughs> stubborn person. Um, and I just wish that I'd had that resource. And then kind of with the parenting book that I wrote, um, which we'll get into, um, it was interesting because I kind of did that because I, it's the resource that I wish my parents had had to be able to support me in understanding myself. Right. Um, so I, I did a lot of reparenting when I wrote yeah. that book. <laughs> um, but no, my, my parents are great. We've, we've worked on a lot of our stuff and they're really supportive and wonderful about all of it. And they read the book and um, I don't think had too big of an emotional um, meltdown about it. So, um, or yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a, uh, that's like kind of a runaround way of saying that everything has really kind of culminated really organically in this like very strange niche that I've found myself in that um, I happen to be very good at, I think. So, yeah. What I think is so interesting about your story is that you were just explaining uh, about like the feminine side of things and not wanting to wear the skirt or the dress or whatever mm -hmm. the situation is. But then you also had experiences where you misgendered when you were younger uh, mm -hmm. to masculinity like misgendered mm -hmm. as a masculine person or people assumed that you were a boy and that also yeah. had a not good effect like yeah and I, and I think it's so lovely that you uh you are you are a they them person now and that you've you found mm -hmm. this because it really was that you didn't like the feminine pressure that you were receiving and you also didn't like like masculine assumption that some people were giving you and you ended up being like this this place in between um or separate yeah. from and i just think that is so cool because i don't think that's mm. um it's common i guess yeah that's interesting that you pick up on that and i've certainly talked to my therapist quite a bit about this <laughs> <laughs> but I, but i also think that um when i was misgendered as male it was always in like a negative way like um i tell a couple of stories about this in my book which I is i believe what you're referencing um and i talk about um the a male counselor at a day camp taking me to the voice changing room and going into the boys changing room and being like, oh no, my body is different than these people's bodies. And I need to hide that. I am, you know, sneaking into this place that I'm not supposed to be in because an adult made a mistake, right? And like, you know, not consciously 
having that internal monologue, but like, you know, um, it feeling, um, it feeling wrong contextually within the situation. Right. And like that, not feeling like, okay, I want to step into my, like the masculine side of like who I am and like that, not being a, uh, like, yeah, positive experience in that way. Um, or like me choosing that. Right. And there are like different moments where that's certainly happened in my life. Um, there was, I didn't talk, I didn't share this story in the book. Um, but there was like a time in like summer camp. A lot of this happens at camp for some reason. Um, <laughs> I don't know what that, that thematic thread is, but we'll go with it. Um, but this was like sleepaway camp and I was like closer to like 13, 14. And there were like these like grease sock hops, right. Where you would like go as like either like Danny Zuko's or like Sandy's right from the movie Grease. And I was obviously wanted to dress up as Danny Zuko because why not? And, you know, didn't understand my transness at all at the time, but like totally chill and very cis of me. And uh, I remember my like friends wanting to like, use the fact that I look like a boy to like trick a girl into slow dancing with me. And I remember like slow dancing with this girl and being like, this feels right, but this also feels very wrong and weird. And like that just like mixture of emotions feeling extremely confusing. Um, and I mean, you know, we can go into like the transness and deception and like all of that, like those like terrible tropes and stuff. But like it for me personally, it, it was just really confusing. And I, again, didn't have the language to be of or like understanding of gender and, uh, you know, attract. I mean, I was in my tween years, right? That's when hormones start to hit. I didn't have an understanding of like sexuality to be able to really like parse through kind of what was going on. And, you know, I can't like project my adult consciousness onto my childhood self and like the amount of understanding that I could have had, but maybe I could have had some tools to be able to like sort through some of those emotions and be able to articulate how I was feeling um, and articulate like what about that was uncomfortable and what about it like did actually feel kind of right and aligned. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I think it just made my childhood and like my experience a lot more confusing more than anything else. Fair enough. And I think that's so interesting because it really is like contextual. Someone else made an mm. error at summer camp and you, or day camp, and then you were feeling like the guilt from that error kind of. And yeah. then like the same things like, was the guilt or the, the feeling that you had with slow dancing, was that really like, just being like oh it's because i tricked you and then you get into that trope of like deception and mm -hmm. whatnot um which i think is so weird when people get angry like you have been lying to me this whole time like um all right well calm down i was just trying to figure things out you know yeah 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 and it's and i think they're more annoyed about you like their perception being incorrect right oh, absolutely. and like that's where it can become dangerous right for especially for trans women trans women of color but it's uh yeah it's this like funky thing of like you can't judge a book by its cover but then you are and then you're getting mad about it when you're incorrect about uh yeah i mean that's just yeah it honestly <sighs> says more about the other person than it does about you oh 100 percent, yeah and so then you've gone on and you created queer kids stuff and this mm -hmm. is um programming that is geared towards uh pre-k students and and young children so tell me a little bit about what it is that you might learn um from queer kid stuff Ooh, the things you might learn um lots of things i hope uh we talk about a lot of different stuff my favorite things to talk about on queer kid stuff are uh i mean gender is certainly kind of like the biggest thing that people ask me about but also that I really love talking to kids about um talk about kind of like sexuality and the LGBTs and like what different families look like and all of this is done very much in a way that's like accessible not just to preschoolers and like even toddlers but like literally to anybody I have adults I know that adults use my work 
not just to like communicate these ideas to kids. They use it to, you know, talk to their grandma about what their non-binary identity means. They use it to um, like help their cousins, like teach their kids. Like it's all about like, okay, how can we rewrite how we've learned about gender and about sexuality as well um, throughout our lives as adults and like, okay, can we all understand that like actually most of us probably have about a toddler's level of understanding of what gender is at all and what i'm doing is really just boiling it down to like the simplest building blocks and then you know you can take that and like start to understand it in more complex ways and build that on top of each other and start to pull in you know different facets of your identity and like i i mean we can get to the point where like i have a a video um where i talk to my you know stuff bear teddy <laughs> right about what intersectionality is and it makes sense and toddlers and preschoolers can understand it it's really not that hard and so adults can understand it too if i'm able to do that so we talk about a lot of different things, sexuality, gender, talk a lot about bodies and like what that looks like. What does like a sex ed for preschoolers look like? It's a lot of consent. It's a lot of this is what our how we talk about our bodies. This is how we do and do not talk about other people's bodies. Most of we don't. Um, and mental health and social justice and activism. So we cover a lot of things with always the um, LGBT plus like incredible inclusive how can we use inclusive language to speak about these things how do we talk about our bodies in that way how do we talk about activism and the LGBT plus movement and then coalition with other movements within that as well and so how do we look at the world through a lens that is more queer and trans centered because that's just like not the world that we live in today at all and is not the world that children experience right and grow up in um, because most people assume that children will grow up to be cisgender and heterosexual when the statistics tell us that that's just not possible and not true given the numbers um so i mean there's i mean that's a big reason why we have these terrible statistics on LGBT plus youth mental health, right? Um, is that, that that kind of like misalignment and misunderstanding of like who your child could grow up to be. Um, so yeah. I love that. And so as a, as an educator, have you ever had a situation where um, you had to deal with anti-queer behavior either in the class, I mean, you're dealing with pre-K um, so you might not get it from students, but maybe parents or administration, um, where you've had to kind of address anti-queer behavior? Yeah, I have never experienced anti-queer behavior from a child. I'm like thinking in the last, how many years, oh gosh, I started Queer Kids Up in 2016. I've been, I mean, I've been doing this work before then, since undergrad essentially. So since uh, 2013, I've really been doing this work have I ever had any kids say, no, that's not true. No, that's not like cool. It's not cool to be gay. I've never heard that from a kid. It is always from the adults. It is always from people on the internet who want to be mad about something. It is, uh, you know, I've had, I've never been, I, I have been heckled in person maybe once or twice before. Um, but for the most part, it's just like anonymous people on the internet. Um, who want to call me names or want to bully me and like want to project their own feelings onto me and uh those people suck mm -hmm. and that's how i feel about it yeah, <laughs> um Honestly. yeah and yeah. it's always anonymous it's like i don't even have a profile picture it's my dog i'm just going to yell at people or whatever and that drives mm -hmm. me crazy um yeah. It's, and it's interesting because you talked about the numbers and whatnot, and I saw a TikTok because, you know, I use the socials, and it was about how if you put all of us queer people in one spot, we would be mm -hmm. the fifth largest state by population in the United States. But Ooh, there's a I whole group of people who want to, like, tell us that we're insignificant, that our numbers are so yeah. small, it doesn't matter. And then then she said that the number of lesbians in this country uh, is more than the population of the state of New Mexico and that the number of gay men in this country 
as more than the population of the state of Utah. And so that doesn't even include like trans people oh and, and non-binary people necessarily, unless they identify within those categories also. But this is just mm. going off of like, oh, we have this gay, lesbian, straight kind of option. It's very 90s. Um, but just taking those numbers <laughs> and you get this like major breakdown of like, what things are actually like. And so it was really interesting because I think when we look at young children, it is so easy for parents nowadays to just be like, oh, I can't wait to meet your your girlfriend when they're talking to their yeah. son or your yep. boyfriend when they're talking to their daughter. Mm-hmm. And what I love, my husband and I always use like your person um, yeah. or we'll say like whomever you decide, we mm-hmm. leave it very open. Um, yep. And so... I think that that's the route to go. And that's a part of the reason uh, that I enjoyed your book. So your book is Rainbow Parenting. And it's really like this Mm -hmm. guide that goes from like birth, pre-birth, like nesting, which I love. Yeah. (laughs) Nesting all the way through, um, you know, it's really through high school, but it really is for everyone. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit. My about publishers that. made me put those age recommendations on there. Oh really? <laughs> I, I fought to try and keep them off, but you know you gotta you, you gotta give people what they want. Right? It's so funny because I shared it as a resource for a class that I was um, graduate teaching this summer, and um, mm. and I mentioned uh, like read the nesting chapter and then think about how you decorate your classroom for your students and think about yes. the things that you put into your classroom. And yes. I was like. Here, here's the thing is that it's like it really is universal and it's not about the mm-hmm. age range and it's not about like giving even giving birth to a child like I had to go through a nesting period with adoption um and so like it really is yeah. universal topics and I just enjoyed it so much so um oh, good I'm so glad parenting is a loose term <laughs> in the title I really uh, and I and I hope that it doesn't deter people from picking up the book because it's I I'm using the term parenting really, really broadly in like a, are you involved in helping raise children? And that includes parents, but it also includes grandparents. It includes teachers. It includes pediatricians. It includes anyone who is in relationship with children. And that is like, 98% 98% of people probably and I would say like glo- I don't know what the actual st- there's probably a statistic out there somewhere about that but that's a, that's global too like children are in our lives and I think what you were speaking to about like I, I had never thought of it in the context of like okay how many people could like fill up queer people could fill up a state right a state's population right but I think that you know the the work of white supremacy and patriarchy and all these things, like a ta- like a tactic of it is isolation, right? To make us feel alone. And I think that that happens generationally too. And I think, I, I hope that like thinking about the term parent a bit more broadly will help people understand the importance of having relationships with children and how you can be purposeful with the young people in your lives and who your life touches, right? And how can you, yeah, take what I'm talking about, about like, you know, (laughs) painting a gender, uh, quote unquote, gender neutral nursery room and use those skills and those concepts and that philosophy, right? It's a really, it's, it's a parenting book, but like, it's really kind of like, the easiest, most accessible queer theory 101. Like it's, I would say it's really more of like a philosophical approach to parenting than anything else. And I think that that's beautiful that you're using that to apply to like how you, in the back to school season that we're in, right? How you can apply those skill sets to building a classroom for a new group of students. And how would you do that differently after you've read the book? from uh went before you read the book and so how might this year look different and this year's classroom look different than the year before right so as we wind down i always ask a few questions um the first i want to ask is what advice would you give to someone who's going into academia they're coming in as a counselor they're a college professor Mm -hmm. they're a 
high school teacher and they are unsure about being their authentic self in the in the school environment mm. for this first year what advice would you give them yeah this is a interesting time to be going into the educational profession for many many a reason especially as a queer trans person um my advice is feel it out um and like listen to your body like listen to like how you're feeling in the situation you're in right like trust your gut um and it also i mean it depends on the state you're in and like how i want people to be safe i want people to protect their peace and their livelihood um this is a i i feel like i've been getting more asks for advice on like this kind of thing a lot more in the past year than i ever have before and i'm, I'm always a little bit hesitant to give advice because it's a really hard time to be an educator and it's a really hard, really hard time to be a queer trans educator. And um, I don't want to advise someone to do something that will um, endanger them or endanger their employment. Um, but I also like don't want people to be in environments that are unhealthy for them. And I, I think like the biggest thing that I could say is like, you deserve to be happy and like you deserve to be in a place in an environment that um is supportive of you and like you should just be able to be a teacher and be yourself so um oh, sounds like something's happening with my dogs <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah i think like in my not advice advice is like yeah listen to your gut listen to how you're feeling no job is worth your like safety or you know worth you know having terrible mental health and i think like so many of us go into education wanting to help and wanting to give back and wanting to help raise a new generation right but also like you deserve nice things. Um, so I think just, you know, vibe checking as often as you can. Absolutely. I think that's my biggest advice as well. And I think the one that's repeated the most on this podcast mm. um, is just, you've got to, you've got to know your environment and do yes. what's going to be safe for you within that environment. Yeah. And like all of that goes like, you know, going into the classroom and like, you know, learning how to be a good teacher for yourself and like who you are as an educator and like understand like, you know, it, teaching is hard without all of that added to it. So like give be a little like with that side of things, like be patient with yourself, like classroom management does not come in the first year. <laughs> <laughs> I have been teaching music for a long for a while now and like I I just had my first week back in preschool and it was absolute chaos hurting cats <laughs> I was just like I've been doing this for a while now and it's uh, there's still things that I'm not uh, you know an expert at it, it takes time so don't expect to like be an absolute expert incredible teacher off the bat like you just need to be you and be there for the kids and that's the best you can be doing you know yep and i would also recommend that like if you're one who knows that you live by comparison on instagram maybe avoid it in august yeah. because there are some people who make some very gorgeous classrooms and whatnot but that's them and you shouldn't have to compare yourself to those folks because also like teaching isn't only aesthetics yeah there's, and I'm I mean, <laughs> I, I love, I love a good set. I love a good preschool classroom, but also like, you know, that's not the whole job. Right. And like, that's not to say that you shouldn't, if you enjoy doing that, but like maybe you're, I don't know. I've been taking some business coaching stuff and so like, <laughs> maybe that's not, maybe that's not your zone of genius, you know, like maybe that's not the thing that like you're fantastic at. I'm sure there is something that you are incredible at, but that person is not good at at all. And you're just not seeing it on Instagram. Absolutely. I also like want to just be cognizant of like our students with disabilities, whether mm. in, in our core classes, in our, in our primary classes who have ADHD or uh, mm -hmm. OCD, or they've got autism or Asperger's like those students are 
going to struggle in an overly decorated classroom. And so there's some yes. things that you can be cautious of just like in general that will be doing what's best for your students. That's kind of like where I land with what are my decorations in my old black box um, before I moved cross country in the old black box. It was all like student stuff in the sense that like my black box had for those of you who don't know, because I realize it's not a theater podcast, so you're getting a ton of theater this season. Um, sorry about it. A black box is a black room that is used to create various styles of stage inside of a theater space so that you can perform in lots of different ways. My classroom was a black box, and I had like the pennants for the colleges that all of my seniors went on to go to, and I had mm. um, the posters from all the productions that we did, and, and then I had props that they made or decorations that the students made for the class, like that they made for a set. So like it really was doing what's best for my students. And I think that when you're going into your classroom, you got to do what's best for your students and also for yourself, because guess what I didn't have to make. I didn't have to make a ton of classroom decorations because I'm using the stuff that my students were doing. And I found stuff that like I could just purchase and put up on a wall. Um, so that's that's a part of it, but really, the whole point of that conversation was know know yourself and and know your environment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the academic community, this, and this is like parents, this is administration as well as educators and anybody really involved in the academic community. What can we do to make schools more inclusive for LGBTQ plus students? Uh, ask for it ask the people who can make it happen right like push for it like i think that the thing that people just get so caught up in being scared like it's it's a it is a scary time right now i'm not gonna lie but like i think that especially if you're not a part of the lgbtq plus community and you're an ally like that is it is so important that people just ask if they can do it push the administration ask for gender neutral bathrooms get my book and pass it on to your school administrator get a parent or a teacher book club going to read it and discuss it Um, bring people like me into your schools there are fantastic lgbtq plus picture books there's a really robust section of the library of them now bring those authors into your schools bring me into your school bring queer kid stuff videos into your classrooms to discuss things use tent pole dates like lgbtq plus history i don't know when this is going to go up but uh, mm-hmm. lgbtq plus history month is in october national coming out day bisexual awareness week is coming up there's lots of different days that you can build curriculum around and you can use existing resources you don't have to come up with all of this on your own there's lots out there right now that you can use you know, uh, like we were just saying, like, you don't have to decorate your classroom all on your own. You don't have to make those lesson plans all on your own, especially if you're not an expert. You can go to people like me, go to people who are very smart on the Internet who have their own resources. And I think it's really just about getting out of your own head about it. And, you know, I think so much of it is like this hesitation that people aren't going to like it. There's going to be this pushback. But, you know, there's only we're only going to make progress if people are trying to push forward and yes people might push back at you but you're also going to see other people gather around you and try to help that's something that i think is so different i mean i've been doing this for a minute now right and it's very it's been very interesting to watch what was happening in my comment section in 2016 become national international discourse right and the difference that I'm seeing now between 2016 and 2023 is that I'm seeing so many more people come out of the woodwork to support this work and who are actually understanding and spreading the word about like why it's important. I mean, my TED talk went viral. Uh, the Blues, Clues, and You video that I worked on with a pride parade went viral. Like all of the, like people are hungry for this stuff, for these resources, for this work. And there are people out there. You are not the only one who thinks that it's important. And uh, you just got to make your voice heard so that those other people know to come around you. And then that's going to, the confidence around that is going to spread. And, you know, 
you know, the state of queer people that's <laughs> the fifth largest state <laughs> in the country, right? It's like, you're going to see that form around you. And, you know, when we're in coalition with each other, it's so much less scary and it works, right? Like we've come a lot since 1969 and Stonewall, we have come a long freaking way. There is a lot to do. There's still a lot of stuff that we have to move forward, but we've come a long way and a lot has changed. And I mean, one in five Gen Z identify as LGBTQ plus now, and that's probably gonna rise with Gen Alpha, just based on the amount of resources that we have now for young people. And I just think you gotta just try because the, my goal is to get as many people as possible just to the baseline right that's all i want we're trying to move the bell curve right and in order to do that we just got to get everybody like just to on the first step of the staircase and i don't think that's asking a lot i really don't i don't think that that's big i think that that is essentially the bare minimum of where, where everybody should be right now right and majority of people just are not there and it doesn't take much to get people up to that next step. It takes a couple of videos. It takes, you know, someone watching my TED talk. It takes, you know, someone here, you know, someone's kid coming out as trans. It takes someone whose kid's friend came out as trans. It doesn't take that much, but we just need to get more people there. It's about critical mass. And so that's just about, you know, visibility and about, you know, getting the message out there and getting the education out there. And, uh, you know, I think school administrators and people with power in educational systems are the people who can help move the needle in a really massive way, even if it feels like small and, you know, within just like one community, it really, that's how that bell curve starts to shift, right? Honestly, if you are out there and you are an ally, please run for office for your school board because that's mm. where we're going to see your ability to make some change happen. Uh, yes. Because right now what we're seeing is very conservative groups actively electing people onto school boards so that way they can kind of hijack curriculum. Um, yeah. And so we see that like even it may not even be happening necessarily by vote in Florida. It's just people getting appointed um, right now mm -hmm. in Houston, uh, Texas, Houston ISD, the state has appointed a board of people that they have decided are the people that are running the school district. And it is it is very, very rough out there. Um, so my best advice yeah. for those of you who are allies is like you do have some power. And unfortunately, this is so unfortunate to say sometimes your voice is more important than ours. Um, and it's not because. Yeah we are not important it's because people have been hearing us scream for so long that yeah. it's not as loud uh because we're tired we're fatigued we're we've been doing this for decades some people you know have been doing this since the 60s and 50s you know depending on yeah. uh if they were able to survive aids in the 80s you know um so there that is my biggest advice is i think that if you are an ally get out there and find a way that you can support um, because there yeah. are things you can do. And educators, we're not allowed to be on the school board. It's a mm -hmm. weird backward system. We are not allowed to make decisions on how schools are ran. So please go out there and, and get on a school board and promote some change from where you are, because that's going to make yeah. a huge difference. Yeah. That's a fantastic call to action. I remember um, I saw this the other day that, I don't remember what state it was, but there were like thousands of book challenges. Um, but they found that they were only written by like maybe like three people, all like hundreds of thousands of book challenges written by like a handful of like, you know, an angry dad or two. And, you know, it really comes down to like, you know, who can make more noise <laughs> in the right ways. And, Conservative folks have unfortunately figured out a couple of ways that work in their favor, and we just have to beat them at their own game. That's that's it. Is that the few 
people are being as loud as they possibly can. And so if we don't have other people to kind of combat that, then it seems like those people are the majority when there's really just a few people. Yeah, exactly. Yep, absolutely. I want to touch one other aspect of your book, if that's okay. So yeah, yeah, let's do it. This topic, like queer kids stuff and, and, and parenting when it comes to, you know, queer people and queer ideologies, um, as people are saying, is very touchy because people think sex and sexual intercourse. And you address this very well in your book. And so how do you, how do we combat that idea of teaching gender and teaching sexuality is not teaching intercourse? Yes. So they're just, I mean, the short of it is that they're not the same thing. Queerness and sexuality and intercourse are, are different things entirely. That's not to say that like you shouldn't have a conversation about sex with young people especially when it's relevant but they're just separate conversations and i think that that's like the biggest thing that people need to understand um because equating queerness to queer sex is taking away so much of the experience of being an lgbtq plus person that is just like one very very tiny part of like the queer experience and what it means to be a queer person that you're boiling down an entire identity to one act right and that is honestly disrespectful (laughs) and i think that we it's so easy to think that okay i have to talk about sexuality that means if i'm talking about queerness then I have to talk about sex and I have to talk about queer sex. And I just, I explain it better in my book. Just, it's been a long day. Just listening to you talk about it <laughs> makes me uncomfortable. Like you have to talk about sex. You have to like, I don't want to talk about sex. Yeah. And, <laughs> and honest, here's the thing is that like a preschooler is not interested in intercourse. They are, th- that is just like not something that they're curious about. I, ask any toddler if they want to know about sex i'm sure they'll be like what's that i don't care here i want to go play with my toy they don't care that's not what they're asking about right where when they're asking about like oh what's uh why does that kid have two dads that doesn't mean you have to talk about anal sex with them right like that's just like not like that's just such a huge leap right like Jasmine and Aladdin kissing in a Disney movie doesn't mean you have to explain intercourse, right? And like, and, you know, missionary position, right? It's just like, it doesn't, it's just like, it's one plus one equals like 300 is like how (laughs) that equation works, right? And like, I think that, you know, if we were to equate these conversations of like, you know, two men a question about two men two dads you know being a conversation about queer sex and like aladdin and and jasmine doing their thing in a disney movie you know needing a conversation about intercourse then what we're talking about are two things where you know queer sex is being demonized and being thought of as this evil thing and this thing that like we don't want to touch or talk about because of connotations around queer sex especially related to the AIDS pandemic. I Mm -hmm. think that that's really made a huge impression on our understanding of what queer sex means and that it's evil and diseased. And that's just not true. (laughs) Um, That's not what queer sex is. Um, It's, just anatomy that's all we're talking about and we're just talking about different parts and we're talking about different parts being used for different things and that's all that conversation is because the conversation about what queer sex is and what heterosexual sex is is the same conversation (laughs) it's just about body parts and intimacy and consent right and we're that's a separate conversation than that kid has two dads right so Absolutely. hopefully that, I don't know. I'm a little tired. <laughs> no, you're <laughs> so good. So that's not like, my like 
typical <laughs> way of framing that, but hopefully that's helpful. I did some research a while back because I was getting pissed off just about the word like homosexuality and whatnot. Mm. And, and just the realization that these like straight men psychiatrists got to make up the word and then Ugh, now gosh, we're stuck yeah. with it. You know what I mean? And so it's yeah. like, I, of course people have, have a problem because the people who created the word had a problem. And mm-hmm. so now here we are having to deal with it, you know, almost a century later. And it's, it's mm-hmm. driving me wild. Like, yeah. I mean, I think the same could be said for like trans, like gender affirming healthcare. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, recommendation here. If folks, uh, folks should watch the documentary framing Agnes and it goes in, it's really fantastically done. Um, lots of really wonderful trans folks who, um, kind of like reenact interviews with um trans people in i I don't remember the the decades um but who were part of like um research and human sexuality research and human gender research stuff and um how they like got gender affirming surgeries um because they were part of these research experiments and stuff um i'm not explaining it very well but it's a fantastic documentary and it's kind of like the trans version of like thinking in that way i love that i'll have to check it out i'm in a um gender communications class right now which i find really interesting Mm. because i'm getting my master's and a part of it is a certificate in culturally responsive pedagogy so like working with diverse Mm. groups of students um And so I'm taking this class and they had me to take a, uh, like a, a test where I find out whether or not my instinct is in favor of homosexuality or heterosexuality. And Mm. what I found frustrating and I had to reflect on this, uh, to my instructor Mm. was this test really put gay men against straight people. Mm. Like it wasn't gay men and lesbians and transgender Mm. people it was gay men and straight people Mm. so then like homosexuality this cloud has kind of been around for a while where it's like people just automatically think one thing and that's also the same thing that was demonized in the 80s and and has been and so one of my my topics was you know this trope of like gay men versus everybody else is just it's done like i know that i already have an inclination like i'm very you know pleased i took this test and i am inclined Mm -hmm. to think that homosexuality is actually more favorable than heterosexuality because that is my lived experience right like (laughs) i wouldn't expect it any other way but at the same time like this idea that it's like gay men versus the world it's just mm. it's so played out and there's so much more diversity in the world and i don't think mm. this psychiatric test or whatever this data that they're collecting is even accurate yeah. because they're not they're mm. isolating one group versus like what would it be like i think that for yeah some I got, i've got a bone to pick with a lot yeah. of researchers i gotta say there's uh especially i mean, I mean in in like mainstream children's media there's a lot of money poured into research of course and um very little of it is talking to and about like queerness and transness they don't even account for queer families most of the time let alone asking kids their pronouns and their gender identity like it's just completely left out of any kind of research and I you know get questions from these people I talk to them sometimes and they're like oh I don't even know like how we would put that into the data sets and like I don't know all these statistical things and I'm just like well you can just like you know ask them their pronouns and show them a video about what that means and then they'll tell you (laughs) and you know or you can just like ask what their family looks like and you know it's it's they're just not like the lack of understanding of just like what to ask because they haven't taken the time to understand that like queer people exist and like are a part of your data set no matter what and you're just not accounting for it in a way that's making it visible and uh yeah i'd like to see more research on um queer families and young and queer and trans kids. Yeah. I'm doing Um, right now research on how queer family is represented in theater. And it's so wild mm. to me because I have this, I made this database from when I was 
working uh, in my queer theater class of like different queer tropes and how they play out mm. in theater. Um, yep. And there's like 600 plays. So first of all, there are 600 plays that fall under queer theater, folks. Like we're not out of small. the entire canon. Out of the entire canon, but also it's not 35. You know, it's it's yeah. 600. So there there's like that's pretty good. There's more than I expected, but also not enough compared to what what exists in the world. Uh, and yeah. and some of these plays were written in like the 1600s. So also like mm-hmm. here we are. We've been here for a while. How much Shakespeare is in that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> um, I did not get to Shakespeare, so I, I bet I can add a crap ton more. Um, I used like criteria of like queer playwright, queer story, queer plot, mm. or queer character, queer plot. Um, cool. And so that doesn't even go into like undertones and, yeah. and homoeroticism that exist yeah. in very, like, so much of the canon. Um, yeah. But um, what I found interesting is that like musical theater seems to tackle queer family and like oh, interesting. straight plays don't. Um, huh. And so I find that super fascinating. And I'm going to dive a little bit into that when mm. I do, like continue my research because my goal is to write an article about it. Um, but here's my, our second call to action. Mm. If you are in the humanities and you are a queer person, do and publish more research. Include us yes. in your research because it's needed. Like, there's Please this... reach out to me for interviews. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I don't always answer my emails because I get very overwhelmed by my inbox. But uh, if you catch me at a good day, I love being a part of those things. And I will definitely give you quotes for your essays. I mean, I've done tons of podcasts and things, so you can find um, things that I've said all over the internet. But um, I love being part of people's research. I think that's so cool that people are using queer kids stuff and things that I make and write to, like, contribute to how we can be more conscious and purposeful about these things and then like make better work even beyond what I'm doing because I think that yeah I mean all of this is it's a growing field right and like we need to set precedent and I think that's the only way we can move forward and progress and find things that are even better than queer kid stuff and I'm excited for that time I love it I love it so we've reached a point in this interview where the tables get to be turned and you have the option mm. to, or the ability to ask me a question or a couple, depending on how you're feeling. So I am all ears. Yeah. Okay, cool. So this is great. Cause I'm going to do a little focus group. On you. <laughs> <laughs> Cause uh, as a part of queer kids stuff, I've been kind of toying with like the business model and figuring out how we operate in like a sustainable way. And we've been doing this project over the last year or so called Queer Teachers Rock, where we've been trying to create programming um, for queer and trans educators. And we've done, we did a kind of virtual conference last year um, that went really great, I think. And then we were doing support groups um, monthly um, from January-ish through June. And that was great. And we're trying to kind of figure out uh, what direction we want to take that um, moving forward. So I want to know what resources you're looking for as a queer and trans educator. That's fantastic. I actually, right before this interview, was a part of an LGBTQ teacher cohort that meets once oh, or cool. twice a month. Um, and so like this was our first meeting. We're just getting to know each other. But mm. the overwhelming consensus was community and connection. So mm. I would even be willing to say, because I am a Y2K kid, like I was... Uh, you know, in high school, learning all the technology when it was coming out. Mm. And I would be willing to say, like, a community where, and it could be paid, it could be exclusive, whatever, but a login mm-hmm. community where it's safe from mm. the outside world. Yeah. Um, a queer space for that. Like, mm. no, this is not to be, uh, you know, discriminatory to our allies, but queer people need queer spaces. Um, yes. And so I think this is one where it would be exceptionally helpful if we had a queer space for mm. the, for teachers to be able to talk amongst themselves. And it could be chat rooms. Mm. It could be um, 
discussion boards, whatnot. Like, Facebook groups is mm. kind of, like, existing, and we get a lot of people, like, asking questions um, and yeah. trying to get answers and whatnot. And Facebook's not my favorite for community building. Yeah, no. And so, like, I, I even – I, I uh, created a Equity in the Theater Classroom Facebook group, and so, like, I created chat rooms and whatnot for that. But I see it very mm-hmm. stagnant. Like, it is not the place to mm-hmm. go for that. So I think a dedicated space that is for community building and connection because mm-hmm. you are absolutely correct in talking about, like, capitalism and patriarchy and white supremacy is all about isolation. And so yeah. here's the thing. The Internet has been created to connect the world. Or, Mm -hmm. you know, that's the story that's being told to us. So we should use it that way. It's part of the reason I created this um, podcast was to let people know that they're not alone um, Mm. and that we all have our stories. And I get I get comments from people like it's it's a small podcast. I love Mm -hmm. my listeners and it's a labor of love and whatnot. And the opportunity to meet so many people is really fantastic because I am a people Mm -hmm. person. Um, But it's a small podcast and when i do get those those uh notices that people are like i'm so happy i found this place i was really feeling isolated mm. like good that is that is what i'm here for and i think that mm-hmm. having a space like that whether it be on the internet or starting a network that starts online and kind of grows to local yeah. resources um mm-hmm. would be ideal um i used to work for cool. a company that like provided music lessons um hmm. And I was responsible for, like, organizing the live functions within my major Mm. cities because even though the company was really focused on, like, you go online and you find your teacher and then you meet your teacher in person or sometimes you just do virtual lessons or whatever Mm -hmm. the situation is, they did, like, live concerts and meetups and whatnot. And so I was responsible Mm. for organizing those things. And I think that having a space online where there can be continual connection and then this opportunity for physical like in-person conversation would be Mm. ideal because again if you put us all in one place it's going to feel overwhelming how many people are there because Mm. the goal is for us to feel isolated yeah yeah absolutely cool that was really helpful you're welcome that uh, that helps with the market research oh yeah for sure yeah i'm gonna I'm going to noodle on that and uh, maybe I'll start a discord. (laughs) Awesome. So before we wrap up, I just want to make sure that everybody knows where they can find you and your resources. So please take this opportunity to share. Yeah. Um, If you want to check out my work through queer kid stuff, it's just queerkidstuff.com. All of the things are there. It's at queer kid stuff on all the social medias. If you want to find me, I'm Linz Amer at Linz Amer. I'm mostly on Instagram nowadays, but uh, also enjoying Blue Sky, which is a, <laughs> a fun time. Um, yeah, those are kind of the places you can find me. You can go buy my book. I have a, a picture book coming out end of February. It's called Hooray for She, He, Z, and They. What are your pronouns today? So please, please, please pre-order that. Pre-order for your libraries, pre-order for your classrooms, pre-order for your homes. Um, I think y'all are going to really like it. And especially if you like the parenting book, it ties just directly into the practice of, you know, putting a daily pronoun practice into um, your, I don't know, your routine with your kids. Um, yeah, those are the things. Also, you can listen to my podcast, Rainbow Parenting. It goes along with the book. Awesome. Well, everybody, I hope you enjoyed the episode as much as I did, because I'm kind of like, I don't know, fan personing out. Um, I don't know <laughs> the right gender neutral phrase for that, so I'm going to have to think that about works. it. But like fan personing out, because, you know, I read your book and I really enjoyed it. Um, so thank you all for joining us, and I hope you all have a great night. Bye. Yeah, thank you for having me. Bye, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Teaching While Queer. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Leave a review, and that would help out tremendously. You can also support the podcast by going to www.teachingwhilequeer.com and hit support the show. Thanks so much, and have a great day.